Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I see people are starting to trickle in. Um, just wanted to say welcome, and we're really excited to have you all with us this morning for this uh, natural capital conversation about climate resilience and nature-based solutions. And um, we will be beginning momentarily. But before we start the conversation, I wanted to just go through a few logistical issues with the um, with the, the Zoom platform and the agenda for today. So the first thing I want to mention is that this webinar uh, will be presented in English with Spanish interpretation available. Our Spanish interpreter is Thais Pardo. Y este seminario web se presenta en inglés con interpretación al español disponible. Y nuestro traductor is Thais Pardo. The speaker's presentations will be in English. Las presentaciones de la oradora serán en inglés. Activate the interpretation option by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Para activar la opción de interpretación de idiomas, haga clic en el botón al interior de su pantalla que tiene un globo y dice interpretación. Click on this button and then select the language you would like to hear, either Spanish or English. Haga clic aquí en interpretación y luego seleccione el idioma que le gustaría escuchar, ya sea español o inglés. It is necessary to select a channel in order to hear the webinar. Debe seleccionar un canal para escuchar el seminario web. And please mute the original audio so you will not hear two languages at the same time. Debe silenciar el audio original para evitar escuchar los dos idiomas a la vez. So now I'd like to give you all a brief introduction to who we are before we move into today's programming. The Natural Capital Project, or NatCap as we call ourselves, is a collaborative initiative working to pioneer science, technology, and partnerships to highlight the values of natural capital and environmental services in a broad range of planning and development decisions. And our goal is to enable people and nature to thrive together. We're centered at Stanford University and we have five additional core partners that you can see on the bottom of the screen. A little bit about this event today. Uh, this is part of our Natural Capital Conversation Series, which is the newest addition to our virtual programming. And you can join us and thank you for joining us today. You can also join us again in coming weeks for live conversations with scientists, practitioners, and leaders in government and business. And our, our conversations are designed to spark engaging discussion, to exchange knowledge and, and learning from others in the field. And we're featuring everything from coastal smart, cli climate smart, coastal planning, to cultural ecosystem services and more. We have a fabulous lineup of panelists shown here, and these are leaders with many years experience working on different aspects of nature-based solutions in science, policy, and finance. Just to give you a quick overview of our schedule for today, um, I should have introduced myself. My name is Adrian Vogel. I'm a lead scientist with the Natural Capital Project, and I'm based at Stanford University. Um, after, uh, once I, once I finish the little introduction, we're going to hand it over to Dr. Gretchen Daly uh, for opening remarks, and then we will move on to our moderated session. Uh, our moderator, Carter Brandon, will give us some, some initial thoughts on making the case, the global case for climate adaptation. And then we'll have our panel presentations with, uh, by Kate Brahman talking about the promise and potential of nature-based solutions. I will give a short presentation on nature-based solutions in practice. And then John Matthews will wrap us up with the nature of funding, aligning NBS with finance. We will have a five minute break following the panel presentations. And then after that five minutes, we'll reconvene for a panel discussion and Q&A moderated by Carter Brandon. <clears throat> and so, uh, one last thing I want to mention about logistics is that we will have, there, there are two ways to communicate with the NatCap team and the panelists. In terms of uh, if you have questions, please use the question and answer box. Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you don't see the question and answer box, you can click that button 
and it will pop up a, a box that you can submit your questions for the speakers or the panelists. And we will also be um, answering those questions as we can during the presentations and during the discussion. We will also, our, our moderator will be selecting some questions um, as we have time to ask the panelists live during the Q&A session. Now, if you have any logistical questions about how to use wet, um, how to use Zoom or you need technical assistance, then please use the, the chat box. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Gretchen Daly to kick us off with some opening remarks. Gretchen is co-founder of the Natural Capital Project and the faculty director of NatCap here at Stanford University. Dr. Daly's work is focused on understanding human dependence and impacts on nature and the deep societal transformations that we need to secure people and nature. She's the author of numerous scientific and popular publications and books, as well as a recipient of several prestigious awards, including the 2020 Tyler Prize for, the Envir for Environmental Achievement and the 2017 Blue Planet Prize. And it's a pleasure to welcome you, Gretchen, um, over to you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Warmest welcome to all of you. Um, today is a tremendous day. I'm most grateful to Adrian and this team for coming together and presenting what is really the most central topic of our times, most central to the future of humanity, uh, nature-based solutions. Um, it's not only the central topic of our times, but an arena in which humanity has maybe a decade to transform dramatically across um, sectors, energy, food, cities, health, water flowing through all of it, and finance and governance and other dimensions of um, how we run the human enterprise are at the core and at stake in this decade ahead. Basically, without dramatic action, we'll be locked into multiple crises unfolding and intensifying um, as we're beginning to experience more visibly and palpably today. At the same time, um, <clears throat> I'd have to say there is a lot of hope. It's um, an exhilarating moment in viewing all of the change that we're seeing on the horizon. So the Natural Capital Project, engaging with partners all around the world in Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe, across all continents, we're seeing tremendous awakening and action. And I'll just highlight a few things that make me most inspired and that you'll hear about in the conversation among these terrific experts who've joined us today. So first, maybe in the realm of um, CEOs, um, working together with our partners in Stockholm, we've been um, convening with CEOs to basically drive a conversation on how to shift the private sector and drive much more investment in basically regenerating the planet after a century of um, a great degradation in Earth's life support systems and climate stability and all the other aspects of uh, our, the life support that the biosphere provides in sustaining um, us physically and in all the other more intangible dimensions in which we depend on the planet for well being. CEOs are waking up to this and saying, you know, we get climate change now. We get um, the climate commitments we must make in our making. And now we really want to get biodiversity and nature. Relating to that, looking at country governments, we see um, just recently, last month, the Dasgupta Review commissioned by the UK Treasury, uh, building on following the Stern Review on Economics of Climate Change, the Dasgupta Review focusing on the economics of biodiversity and the risks and devastating costs um, that come from the loss of biodiversity in the planet's um, natural systems. If we look across at major public sector financial institutions, 
the major development banks. Um, it's extremely heartening to see uh, dramatic action in the form of um, all sorts of shifts in practice and mindset and in the tools and approaches really needed to drive this investment in regeneration. So with the World Bank, for example, um, the Natural Capital Project is co-leading development of the Natural Capital Index, a new set of tools and metrics for charting pathways to human development that are in harmony between sort of economic development and securing and um, regenerating life support systems, nature um, in all of the different sectors. Uh, second, with the World Bank, we're working across cities, across their global platforms for sustainable cities to highlight both the risks of climate, health, um, and other impacts coming from degradation of the biosphere and highlighting especially the pathway to investing in um, securing coastlines for climate resilience, securing water supplies, um, securing nature within cities and adding to that to maintain and support human health and well-being. Across Europe, we've seen 775 cities just in the last um, couple of months adopt natural capital project tools to scope out the opportunity for investing in nature to achieve security in all these climate and other dimensions of human well-being. And then looking at other major development banks, um, IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Asian Development Bank have both launched natural capital labs. ADB's launch is in progress right now, and uh, both are advancing basically the finance and the governance that we need to um, make these sort of lofty commitments that leaders are now um, putting out there, making them real across landscapes, across coastlines, and within cities um, all over the world. Then finally, I wanna mention with ADB just a week ago, uh, the Asian Development Bank was key in developing a new metric called gross ecosystem product that is um, a way of tracking the value of ecosystems to society. It's been designed uh, together with Carter and many, many people um, both on the panel today and um, engaged in this conversation today. It's been designed alongside GDP to report basically the value to society of all the goods and services delivered by ecosystems and to allow governments, whether at the city scale or national scale, to track progress um, in securing benefits of nature to people. And that just last week, um, Thursday last week was certified officially by the United Nations Statistical Commission as a key metric for potential deployment globally. So in all of these realms, um, we're seeing a lot of action, but the challenge really is ahead and that's what um, Carter Brandon and others here are going to open up for us. I just wanna introduce Carter briefly to you. It's been a tremendous um, privilege and pleasure working with him over the years. His background um, is in economics and finance, of especially today, climate change and adaptation, where he's leading a major effort at World Resources Institute, focused on green and resilient recovery from the pandemic and the times we're in, and on pricing the risk um, <clears throat> of all that we're facing in private sector and financial markets. Carter's been at World Resources Institute since 2019. Before that, he was at the World Bank for over 20 years, um, based in DC and also for lengthy years long stretches in both Argentina and in China. 
and for all the students and younger people on board here, uh, here's how we got started within economics, um, first at Harvard and then at a, as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, getting his PhD. But I think maybe the most wonderful aspect of Carter is his um, playing music. So he's played in the Paris Symphony and um, has made music in all sorts of ways over the many years. And I'm going to turn over to him now to conduct um, this conversation among us and uh, make some music today with, with the group here and, and then wishing him all the best at WRI and all of us all the best going forward. So thank you so much again for joining and here's handing over to our conductor, Dr. Carter Brandon, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gretchen, what a wonderful introduction. So I, I have to make a, a, a little uh, side comment for those interested in music, uh, I was, listening to Brahms' first symphony, second movement the other day. And it struck me as the perfect short piece of music to capture the year of this pandemic, and also to capture the, the tone of Gretchen's comments about, we have a, you know, an unprecedented global crisis in front of us, but there are rays of hope. It's just a beautiful piece of music. It starts dark, it has some illuminating melodies, it goes dark, and then it finishes with some inspiration. So anyway, if you like classical music, I certainly suggest that. Um, anyway, thanks again for being here. I think my job is to frame a little bit what we're talking about. So let me share my screen and then we'll get on with the presentations. Um, uh, here we are. So we are, we are grappling with sort of overlapping priorities, overlapping areas uh, today. We certainly make, uh, we all know there's a, a environmental crisis. I don't have to go into uh, even what Gretchen talked about, the, the, the collapse of uh, ecosystems, ex pending extinction of a quarter of the world's species, land degradation of a quarter of the world's agricultural land. And even more, and and you know, fisheries collapse, coral reefs collapse, uh, Arctic ice collapse, etc. But even more, the tipping points that are coming up that we can't predict, can't control, but are somewhat irreversible. So the case for nature, we're all on board. Then we have uh, the case for adaptation, where within building, restoring, investing our natural capital, we also help achieve resilience. We achieve many other things too. We have you know, uh, productive assets, we have carbon sequestration for emissions, et cetera, but we have a few things that benefit adaptation. And then finally, today we're gonna to talk about the case for water. Um, there's a saying, hopefully you've heard it, but I'll repeat it. Water is to adaptation what energy is to mitigation. When we talk about carbon emissions, um, uh, you know, there's nothing but removing fossil fuels, removing fossil fuel technology and replacing it with other technologies. For adaptation, there's nothing like managing water, water supply, sea level rise, storms, uh, uh, droughts, etc. cetera. So this is, this is the area of our discussion today. Now, um, I spent a lot of time the last two years working with something called the Global Commission on Adaptation. And in making our case for nature as fundamental to adapting to climate change, we came up with this chart that the natural environment and what we invest in supports resilience basically across every sector that we cannot survive without investing in nature. Water, of course, is first and foremost, water flows, supply, uh, flood, soil erosion, et cetera, but it underpins food, cities, infrastructure, supply chains, uh, disaster risk management. The, um, um, the uh, focus today is on water, but I just want to plant that the benefits of nature as we invest in water go beyond into these other sectors. And so part of our pitch can be, we're doing what we can for water, going deep, but we're also benefiting in other ways. And that's the sort of the broad story of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services have immediate benefits, direct benefits, 
but they also have indirect benefits. And we don't want to lose sight of that as we get from the world of science to the world of policy to the world of finance. Um, I'm going to go back to my little chart. Uh, these three areas of overlap, nature, adaptation, and water. What is the link between, and I just, that chart I just showed you was connecting these two top circles. What's, what's the case for nature and the case for adaptation? Well, it maps across all those different sectors. Well, now let's look at the link between the case for nature and the case for water. Well, as I said, ecosystem services, provision, flood control, settlement control, filtration. These are everything we need to invest in to improve our resilience for the water that we need. And also, of course, for the uh, ecological uh, biodiversity functions that rely on water. Now, what's the link between the other side, adaptation and water? Well, water helps us in other things that maybe isn't water supply, but certainly coastal protection, climate regulation, health. So nature is everywhere, adaptation is everywhere, water is everywhere. And um, uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation that talks about these links went a little bit further. And this was sort of the map that we gave to our work that I uh, personally have found quite useful in the year and a half since we came up with this map, that to, to better understand what needs to be done, to build the knowledge, the technology, the incentives, the critical mass, the scale, and then the impact, we need these three steps. And it's like a virtuous circle. We need better understanding. People don't really always know what climate impacts are, what uh, risks are, how to evaluate risks, how to deter, uh, distinguish between short and long-term risks, and how to invest now to reduce those long-term risks. It's a huge challenge in understanding, and it's not in one place. It's everywhere. It's in schoolrooms, it's in communities, it's in governments, it's in banks, it's in private sector, public sector. And so understanding is not one thing, it's everywhere. And as the right-hand side of the chart shows, it's different in every sector. But once you understand a bit more about risk, what the challenges are, then you have to get real. What are we actually planning to do out of a million things you could do? What are the priorities? What's the critical path? Where is their consensus? Where's their, um, you know, uh, the, the technology and the feasibility? And of course, the money required. You don't get the money in this world unless you have a good plan. No one's handing out money for free. It's too scarce. And you don't have a good plan unless you have good understanding. And you don't improve in all three of these unless you have a, uh, a virtuous circle. So today we're looking at understanding planning finance, particularly in the water sector. I'm actually delighted to say that the, um, the um, let me get rid of my screen now. Delighted to say that we the three presentations we have, not coincidentally, because it's sort of the way to go forward, really map very well to those three stages of better understanding, better planning, better finance. So our first speaker, is Kate, is on sort of building the case, the demand, the understanding. Our second speaker, Adrian, is on, okay, how do we plan bringing science and, you know, to the, to the community and to the project level? And John, uh, the third speaker, is, okay, we have some good ideas. How do we finance it? How do we work with the financing institutions? So I think this model works, and um, um, I hope you agree, and I hope it uh, generates questions afterwards. So with no further ado, Let's go to our first speaker, Kate Brahman. I see her on my top left of the screen, but uh, Kate, if you can say hi. She's a, uh, she, her, her, her main home is at the University of Minnesota at the Institute on the Environment, but she's also currently a AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellow at the U.S. Department of Defense. And it's actually uh, a bit surprising, but also super welcome to see the Department of Defense involved in climate change and, and, and risk and resilience. Because, you know, I think the Pentagon, I'm, I'm saying you know the Pentagon, but if you do, it'd be great to hear, uh, knows as well as anyone that this is a, 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 a global, social, human, and uh, security risk that we have in addition to everything else. So, uh, Kate, over to you. Thank you, Carter. It is a delight to be here. Um, 
the Pentagon is extremely concerned about climate change. In addition to the executive orders that have just come out, the Secretary of Defense has um, actually put out a memo about how important addressing climate change is. All of that said, I want to be super clear that I am speaking as an individual and absolutely not on behalf of the Pentagon. Um, or anything else related to the Department of Defense. I am Kate Brownman, and I work at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that you see my slides and not my slide share, and I will jump in about what some of the promise and potential of these nature-based solutions are. So now they're not moving forward. Um, we hear a lot about nature-based solutions. We just heard a lot about how great nature-based solutions are. Um, the Natural Capital Project and a lot of our partners are working on them. The 2018 UN Water World Water Development Report was entirely focused on nature-based solutions for water. This is really exciting and people are interested for a number of reasons. So one of them is that nature-based solutions have the potential to be less expensive than built infrastructure. Built infrastructure is really expensive. So in places where infrastructure is failing and needs to be replaced, in places where we're building infrastructure for the first time, and in places where infrastructure is not working, nature-based solutions have the potential to really address some of these issues at lower cost. Um, as Carter and Gretchen both talked about, there's some really exciting co-benefits that can come with nature-based solutions. So culverts are extremely effective at moving water underneath roadways, but they're not good for very much else. Nature-based solutions have the potential to provide a variety of benefits in addition to the water benefits that we're interested in. And Finally, we're starting to see that what we have now isn't working, especially as climate changes, we're putting different kinds of pressure on our need for water infrastructure and green infrastructure has the potential to be more resilient. And that's really exciting. So great. I mean, this has sold me, we should do this, right? What are we doing? So what, what are nature-based solutions? And the answer is actually extremely broad. There's a big bucket of things that fall into the category of nature-based solutions for water. So some of these, like you're seeing in the top row of this graphic from UN Water, really look like nat nature and nature management. Um, reforestation, and not just reforestation, but conservation of existing landscapes that are already providing benefits, um, natural and constructed wetlands for filtration. We can see slightly more managed systems where, for example, buffer strips are put between um, urban development or agricultural development that's uh, creating dispersed pollutants to try to keep those from getting into water. And then we also see really more um, hands-on uh, built solutions that take advantage of what we've learned from nature. So in urban settings, we're seeing um, green roofs for absorbing water and bioswales along the sides of roads, again, for absorbing water. We could even think about a dry toilet. I actually love that they have this on here. Nature does a great job at recycling the nutrients and waste. Why can't we take advantage of that? So thinking about nature-based solutions in general is great. Thinking about nature-based solutions in specific is really important because when we think about whether we're conserving landscapes or really building new things, we're going to have different effects and we're gonna have different co-benefits. I feel confident saying there are different co-benefits from reforestation than there are from dry toilets. So think about what it is that you really wanna get out of this. But what all of this comes down to really is the, the big idea that nature affects our quality of life and that we can and do manage nature, whether that's conservation or enhancement or restoration or degradation, and that affects our quality of life. And so being able to, to describe and quantify these impacts, nature's contributions to people or ecosystem services really allows us then to think about feedback loops where we can manage differently or better in order to improve our quality of life. And I don't know, this seems like a pretty good idea to me. And it apparently seems like a good idea to lots of folks because we are seeing this being deployed 
all around the world. Investments in watershed services where downstream communities are investing in upstream communities so that um, changes in land management can improve water resources downhill are something that's happening all over the world. And it's happening because there's a real demand for it we are seeing bad things happen. <laughs> We're seeing bad things happen when we mess with nature and we wanna look to nature to try to solve some of these problems. So I'm gonna talk about flooding for the next couple minutes of this talk. Um, I will freely admit that I have chosen flooding as an example because the pictures are very much more spectacular, but we could be talking about this for water supply, um, for water filtration, for all kinds of other water services. So when we talk about nature and flooding, we, we know that nature-based solutions work. When you change natural ground cover to impervious surfaces, you see much more runoff and much less water moving into the ground. We know this works. We also know, though, that this is not a panacea. So there's three things that I want to emphasize that we think about when we try to understand what the effects of nature-based solutions for water are going to be. So that's scale, sites, and science. So when we talk about scale, we really need to talk about the scale of the nature-based solutions that we're putting into place and the scale of the problems that we're trying to address. And that's both in terms of sort of, well, what's the size of the city and how many rainwater collection planter boxes are we putting in? And are we putting in enough to make a difference? But we also need to think about the scale of the problem. So that flooding picture that I showed you was from Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey dumped over a meter of rain in five days. It doesn't matter very much what your land cover is. You're going to have a flood if you get a meter of rain in five days. It's actually substantially less than that too. So we need to think about this match between the solutions and the problems when we talk about green infrastructure the same way we do when we talk about built infrastructure. We need to think about where nature-based solutions are being put in place, or more importantly, being conserved. One of the things you can see in this map of the greater Houston area is that Houston was pretty much built in a swamp. And it turns out that swamps flood. Or more precisely, swamps don't flood, they're just wet. And it's okay when they're wet because that's the way they're supposed to be, that's how they function. It's really bad when houses are wet. And so, Putting in wetlands might not fix a flooding problem in other places, but it does provide a place for that water to go when the water's going to go there anyway. And finally, there's a lot of science that we still need to do to really understand why and how nature-based solutions are effective. And understanding that's really going to help some design and deployment. So, you know, we have here some pictures that are really inspiring and we talk about mangroves for coastal flooding and reforestation for upland flooding. But what happens when we reforest? What does a forest look like? What are the biophysical flows that are happening there? And I really like this picture because this is definitely a forest and this is a path through, through a forest. And, Part of the reason we like forests is for these co-benefits. We want to be able to go hiking there. And sure enough, when you walk on a path, it gets compacted. We get water build up there and it gets muddy and it might even have flow coming off it that would be offsetting some of those impacts of having forest instead of other kinds of land cover upstream of where we want to stop flooding. And so really thinking about what are the mechanisms? What do we want to conserve or design when we put nature-based solutions in place are really important. And beyond that, it's really important to think about what our metrics of success are. So this muddy path is a problem if you're not wearing shoes. But if you've got your boots on, it might not be that big a deal. So as we go back to this idea of nature's contributions to people, if what we're really interested in is dry feet, there's a couple ways we could get that. And one of those is, you know, with boots. But we might also really think about what the environmental conditions are. Is there water on the ground? 
And so between the water on the ground and the boots, that's where we're getting to our dry feet. And nature very well may be and probably is reducing the amount of water on the ground, but there also may still be water on the ground. And so our nature-based solutions might have to happen in conjunction with boots or other kinds of solutions, really thinking about a matrix of ways that we're getting to the real issues that are important to us. We also really wanna think about when we're building these nature-based solutions, what could they be doing and what are they actually doing? And so often we talk about, gee, there's all this potential, but we need to do a lot more measuring and monitoring to really understand what works and how can we make that happen more effectively. So I'll close by saying nature-based solutions have a ton of potential. It's really exciting. And they definitely can reduce the size and durations of hazards or help affect our water supply, our water clarity. There are things we can do to really grow and build with nature-based solutions. They can also help us avoid some of the problems that we're having. We can get people and stuff out of harm's way by embracing nature and the idea that nature is actually designed to live in some of these, say, mushy spots. And finally, we need to think about recovery. Do we have the physical and the institutional support to reattain well being? You know, it's the are those boots available and are they available to everyone while we also think about some of these nature based solutions? And I will end there. I am very happy to answer questions in the chat and I'm really looking forward to the panel. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Kate. Great, just as promised to show the uh, show the promise itself of the uh, NBS. So we're turning now to our second presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Adrienne Vogel. She introduced herself briefly at the beginning. Uh, she's the lead scientist with the uh, NADCAP project at Stanford, and she actually runs the Securing Freshwater Initiative and uh, has worked for years on how land and forest management impact water resources particularly in the face of changing climate conditions. And she's um, super interested in working not just with scientists, but across the spectrum of research policymakers and civil society. Also in quite a number of parts of the world, Latin America, Himalayas, US and Africa. So thanks, Adrian, over to you. Adrian? I think you're yes, on sorry you about that. I lost my mouse for a moment. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Carter. And as mentioned, I'm going to be um, talking a bit about, you know, how do some of these nature-based solutions work in practice? And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all of the science and the details about uh, all of the things that Kate teed up really well. Um, but I just want to give a little bit of an overview of the kind of things that I think about when it comes to project level um, planning and implementation of these kind of nature-based solutions. And particularly, how do we move from, from the fact that we have still a bunch of uncertainty in the science towards some informed action? So first of all, I, I wanna give two examples of analyses that I've worked on that demonstrate the potential for large benefits to accrue from investments in NBS. Uh, one is the establishment of a water fund, which is a payments for watershed services scheme in the source watersheds for Nairobi, Kenya. And the second is for investments in soil and water conservation practices and slope stabilization in Nepal that benefit farmers, communities, and critical infrastructure for hydropower. Here on the map, you can see uh, the source watersheds for Nairobi located just north of the city. And in recent decades, poor land management in, these, in this area has resulted in high levels of land degradation, in turn causing some serious threats, both to the resilience of smallholder farmers and to the water supplies for the four and a half million people living in Nairobi. So the Water Fund was designed um, to implement nature-based solutions in um, the agri agricultural lands in these source watersheds and was designed to address the, these issues. We had um, problems with erosion and loss of fertile soil. 
sediment and pathogens polluting the water supplies for communities throughout the watershed, as well as the water supply for Nairobi. Increases in operations and management costs for the hydropower uh, operators. And on top of that, there's this expectation that climate change is going to further increase these risks and the degradation. So just to give you a quick idea of some of the results that we got out of the study, we did a watershed modeling analysis where we implemented these MBS practices. And here are two of the benefits we looked at. One is the sediment on the left and the water flow on the right. And these graphs are comparing um, in an average year how much sediment and flow you would get both with and without the water fund activities in place. And you, we saw from this that there is a pretty significant benefit in terms of sediment and erosion reduction, um, particularly in the, in the rainy seasons, and a small but potentially important increase in water flows, particularly during the dry seasons, which is important for a lot of these farmers that do depend on rainfall and sort of hand irrigation from small streams. We also did an economic analysis of these benefits, and we assumed that the investments would occur over a 10-year time period and considered a 30-year time horizon for valuation. So the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is that benefits take time to manifest. So you do see a, an in, initial investment that is needed before you start to see a return on that investment. Um, but in the end, over the 30 year time period, we found that there is a potential for a $2, $2 worth of total value of benefits for every $1 invested in the water fund and the, and the activities in this watershed. So that's one positive example. Um, and then the second one I want to talk about is the slope stabilization and best practices in Nepal. And in this project, we focused on soil and water conservation activities undertaken by the Nepal Department of Forests in the catchment area for the Kaligandaki hydropower facility, which you can see in the small inset map on the left. And many of the issues faced in this area are the same as what we saw in Kenya. We were worried about erosion and loss of fertile soil for smallholder farmers. There's concern about land degradation, which is increasing the risk of landslides. Um, again, impacts on the operations and management for the downstream hydropower and the concern that the, the erosivity of the rainfall and the storms was just going to get worse as we um, have climate change impacts manifesting. So in this case, we also looked at some of the many co-benefits of investing in NBS and all, again did an economic valuation of these. So the benefits that we, um, well, first of all, we did a modeling analysis, uh, again, using INVEST along with some newly developed approaches for assessing landslide risk, sediment transport. Um, and we were able to evaluate a broad set of economic co-benefits for investing in these nature-based solutions to address the sediment problem. So besides reducing the O&M costs for hydropower downstream, we also looked at uh, avoiding lives lost in landslides, the additional carbon storage that could be gotten from this, um, as well as on-farm benefits to landholders in terms of uh, maintaining the productivity of their lands, and also avoiding landslide damages to infrastructure and roads. So the bottom line here, um, this graph shows the aggregate uh, economic results of an economic benefit of implementing these practices um, at the scale that we modeled. And the x-axis here is the budget ranging from half a million up to 50 million US dollars. Um, and the average benefit to cost ratio for each budget level is shown in the blue dots. We also looked at uh, we considered a range of estimates in terms of costs and economic model parameters and the impacts of those assumptions on the cost benefit or the benefit cost ratio are the, the black lines with the arrows. And so even with conservative assumptions, which would be represented by the bottom of these black arrows, you can see that the benefit cost ratio for the investing in these NBS solutions remains above one. It is cost effective up to, um, I'm sorry, it looks like my dashed line got moved a little bit. It's supposed to actually be at one. So if you consider the, the arrows above one, uh, up to about 5 million US dollars, you still see a positive benefit. So 
there's a good chance that these kinds of programs are going to be cost effective and are going to return positive benefits to society. So those results have been published in a recent World Bank report, which is available online. So we know that this potential exists and modeling the scaling up of these practices is one thing and is really important to build political and financial support. Um, but what do the data say about you know, what benefits have we seen in practice? And so this question uh, led me and my fellow colleagues, including some of the panelists here today, to embark on an effort to provide some clarity on what the data show us about the impacts of different MBS investments on the metrics that matter for water security, things like annual water yield, short-term runoff, peak flow, groundwater recharge, etc. And this work was supported by the Science for Nature and People Partnership. And our idea was that if we could um, improve understanding and share the state of science about what the impacts of these practices actually are and have been measured on the ground, that this could drive even more investment in new programs and help scale up and help um, unlock more financing. But what we actually found in the literature is not so straightforward. So first of all, as Kate mentioned earlier, the term NBS can refer to a lot of different practices, including protecting existing forests and wetlands to reforesting degraded areas, also to implementing more sustainable practices in croplands and rangelands, and among many, many others. I hadn't heard of the dry toilets as an NBS option, but yes, so you, you get a sense of how broad a range of things we're talking about. So and because there's so many different practices under that umbrella, the impacts we found also vary widely. So first of all, just looking at reforestation, I'm actually gonna show some data from a review done a few years ago, looking at reforestation impacts on annual water yield or runoff on the left and on base flow on the right. And base flow is uh, dry season flow or flow during the dry season. And these results indicate that replanting trees often results in less water downstream. Um, you know, more, more than, almost or more than three quarters of the time you end up with less water. Although sometimes um, you do see an increase, which is more common in base flow than for the annual water yield or runoff. And in other cases, the results are mixed. And so um, we also realized, we saw this study for reforestation, but we realized that there's currently no synth synthesis of the empirical evidence for NBS practices in working lands, in agricultural croplands and rangelands. So we embarked on a systematic literature review to determine the state of science for how these practices affect different parts of the hydrologic cycle. And what we found first off is that research in this area does not match the scale of our ambition. So we found by far that most published studies are done at a plot scale. This graph is just showing you the number of studies that we found in our review, um, looking at agriculture and rangelands and the water uh, benefits or the hydrologic impacts of MBS practices. By far, people are looking at and measuring impacts on a plot scale. Far fewer studies are actually looking at the integrated impacts of these practices at a landscape scale. And my second graph here just reiterates that point. Um, this one shows the number of measurements reported across all studies in our review and which hydrologic measurements they act actually report. And this shows we have a much stronger base of data to show the impact of MBS practices on the local and the short scale hydrologic effects. So runoff over a short time frame is by far the most studied parameter, followed by infiltration. Annual flows are investigated in a fair number of studies, but the impacts that really speak to flood risk and drought resilience, like peak flow, low flow, and ground, groundwater recharge are given much less attention. And yet we know that a lot of MBS programs are implemented with the expectation that we're gonna have adaptation benefits in exactly those issues. Um, one last bit of data I wanna show you before I wrap up is that um, uh, just to get a little bit more detail on one of these practices, just looking at vegetated buffers in both rangelands and, and croplands. And even just understanding whether you're gonna see an increase or a decrease in flow depends very much on the context. So this graph is showing you the number of measurements because there could be more than 
one measurement per study. So this is actually the number of measurements that are reported either a positive impact on flows or a negative impact on flows um, for each of the metrics, the flow metrics that we looked at. And again, you can see that most studies by far are looking at runoff followed by infiltration and annual flow. And that many studies actually show a reduction in um, inflow after implementation of these practices. Although in some cases you do see an increase in runoff and infiltration and a few cases of increases in the others. So this really just speaks again to the importance of context and understanding your local context in order to um, in order to efficiently, effectively design NBS programs to meet the objectives you want to meet. Um, I did want to just caveat when I talked a lot about water flows, but we do know from Kate's presentation that the links between land degradation and declining water quality are well documented and are more um, are more clear. There are also very clear benefits of for water quality from restoring natural vegetation and planting riparian buffers. But we also know that it matters a lot where practices are implemented. Um, the landscape configuration plays a huge role in how effective vegetation is at reducing pollutants to water sources. So given all of this, um, where do we go from here? And so here are some ideas for a path forward. First of all, I think it's important to reiterate, just as um, Kate mentioned earlier, that you need to design projects very carefully, just as you would with gray infrastructure. You need to understand the local context using both a con your conceptual understanding of hydrology as well as drawing on local expertise to avoid unintended consequences. And the last thing you want to do is say, we're going to go plant a million trees and then because we have an issue of water security and then you go plant a million trees and actually you end up with less water than you had before. So uh, the unintended consequences, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, secondly, start locally. So local benefits we know from the science can accrue more rapidly and can be used to justify the immediate investment and build buy-in with landholders to maintain the practices and to, and to increase them to the scale that's needed to be able to see these large scale landscape impacts on water security. Next, we need to protect wherever possible. The science is not, is not, um, equivocal on the benefits of protection. There are very clear benefits to maintaining the invisible infrastructure where it exists for continuing to receive the water benefits that communities have depended on for centuries. Um, again, back to sort of the design principles, it is really important to identify exactly what your objectives are, your primary objective, and then what you would be okay with as co-benefits or what kind of trade-offs you would be okay with, and to think about these things in the design phase. Um, and then also a landscape level or basin level perspective and looking at water balance again is really important, again, to avoid those unintended consequences. And then finally, um, we cannot forget about climate change. It is really important to consider not only current conditions, but how these conditions might change in the future. Um, so with that, I am, uh, oh, I forgot one of the most important points, which is of course to monitor and adapt and to be flexible and to be actually measuring what impacts you are having. Um, Yes, so with that, I am going to turn it back over to Carter, and I really look forward to interacting with you all in the chat and in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That's great. I have questions, others do too, but we'll get back to that after the break. And so we'll move straight into the, uh, uh, to the final presentation. As, uh, as I said, we've gone from sort of science and demand and understanding to actual planning and some of the costs and benefits, et cetera, very, very, very interesting and concrete. Now to finance. So John's, uh, John Matthews' presentation is called Advances in Financing for Climate Resilient Investment. And John is the, um, is the co-founder and the um, coordinator of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, also known as AGWA which is hosted by the World Bank and the Stockholm International Water Institute. And just like a lot of us, he's a practitioner who tries to blend good science and technical knowledge with policy and uh, uh, concrete practical applications of water adaptation 
management. So John, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, it won't let me start my video. I think I need uh, permission to do that. Okay, super, thank you. All right, and sharing my screen. Can you see uh, the first slide? Yes, perfect. Super, thanks Carter. And thanks for the nice introduction. I'm really grateful uh, to Adrian for the invitation to come here and um, I've really enjoyed the uh, talks and interventions so far. It's already a lively conversation in the chat. Um, as Carter mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I, I have a, a background as an aquatic ecologist, but I, I really think of myself as a practitioner. And, uh, and for the last uh, uh, 14 years or so, I've been working in this water and climate space um, uh, in, uh, in, in Agua for a little over a decade now. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a, a segment of Agua's work, which is how to try to align some of the emerging ideas that we have around NBS, uh, around uh, resilience uh, in water, uh, uh, with uh, funding in finance. Uh, a short report that uh, was prepared with the UK government uh, in Agua that came out last summer, uh, northern summer, is I uh, focused on specifically on water finance and nature-based solutions. If we look globally, uh, uh, in our survey at least, uh, it looks like NBS only get about one to 5% uh, in water security globally. Uh, there's a report that came out, I believe just this week from WRI that looks at uh, NBS and climate finance, uh, so, so a subset, and their estimate is actually even smaller, uh, maybe uh, 0.6, uh, to uh, 1.5 uh, uh, of, uh, percent of, of climate finance uh, globally. Of course, that is not specific uh, to water. Water would be an even smaller component there. And the obstacles, uh, I'm, I'm gonna first talk about uh, some of the mythologies, uh, I think, uh, that we have around uh, 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 climate finance uh, and uh, uh, MBS uh, and uh, funding and finance more generally. Um, but I, I'd like to start off with uh, a uh, with a, a quote. Um, I, I like to think that part of my work is uh, trying to remove the BS from NBS. Um, and I think there's been a tension. Uh, do we talk about nature-based solutions from an advocacy perspective or, or do we try to talk about them from a, a kind of hard-nosed uh, investment perspective? It's much more difficult, it's really challenging. This is a, a quote from a, a session that I was in uh, last August uh, and Lord uh, Goldsmith is the UK environment minister. Interestingly, he's the minister for the COP. I forgot to update that uh, he is now with FCDO. Uh, uh, DFID is a no more, uh, FCDO is the current acronym. Um, and he said in this quote, I think uh, with a lot of insight, our recent research suggests that the odds are currently stacked against infrastructure investment in nature due to our procedures, keyword procedures. And while now is the time to accelerate the use of nature-based solutions for water, we know it is no panacea to the water crisis uh, and we need to rebalance the scale so the natural options are considered equally alongside traditional infrastructure. I would argue that, that really in, in many of our water decisions, we have artificially pushed aside uh, uh, NBS as, as the set of options. That also means that, that uh, we need to also not isolate uh, in NBS as a separate track, I, I think is one of the implications that he's making here. Some of the um, uh, myths that I, uh, I have uh, observed over time, I, uh, we lack evidence of efficacy uh, around uh, NBS. Uh, this is often described as, let's wait for the scientists to tell us what we need to do. Um, I'm a scientist. Uh, 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 scientists are really terrible about telling people what to do. This is just not in our job description. We're not going to do it. Uh, 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 I wouldn't wait on that. Don't hold your breath. Uh, investors and lenders are not confident or familiar enough uh, with NBS. This is the low demand hypothesis. I actually don't think this is uh, uh, right either. 
Uh, I've worked with uh, many of the development banks, uh, with uh, commercial, private finance. Uh, they actually are quite familiar. Uh, there are often other obstacles that they face uh, than, uh, than a lack of demand. Uh, engineers are really the, the, the group that are at fault and they're just not developing enough NBS projects. I think this might be the kind of uh, purest advocacy argument. It's a low supply issue. Engineers just don't care uh, about NBS. Um, most of the engineers I meet, uh, especially the ones that are say maybe under 40, uh, majority of them globally I meet are women actually and they are uh, angry at me as an ecologist for not helping them develop more NBS projects. Uh, we can't uh, easily assign economic value to economic services. And we just need to wait for the latest tool to help us come up with a, a dollar or RAND or RMB to associate with a particular ecosystem services. I don't really uh, believe that either. We've had these tools, this discussion about ecosystem services for 30 years, it hasn't actually gotten us very far in many cases. Uh, and then uh, lastly, NBS projects are too small, they're too niche, investors don't care. And the counter evidence I have there is from May of 2019, this was a 5 billion euro room for the river, uh, almost as pure of an NBS approach, uh, very focused on climate change. It's a sovereign green bond from, uh, uh, from the finance minister. Uh, it, uh, it sold out in less than an hour it was actually oversubscribed by a factor of seven uh, over the course of the day that they had it on the market. Um, uh, their uh, investors care, investors are highly interested and motivated. I think actually uh, we, uh, those of us who really care about MBS are not doing our job. Some alternative hypothesis that I'd like to suggest. We've not really treated NBS as an administrative and a process issue. So I think of this as embedding, try to actually understand how people make decisions at, at a fairly granular level, procurement, economic evaluation, comparison methods. So they're thinking about a range of gray infrastructure options. Why aren't they thinking about a, a range of hybrid and green uh, options in there as well? And then how do we uh, uh, make, make those uh, judgments? Investment lifespan analysis that immediately rebalances the process and multi-purpose investments that also uh, lit plays to the strengths uh, of MBS, especially if we're talking uh, about uh, climate change. Uh, NBS are not a separate agenda. This may be my most important point, and I would say it's the, uh, the fatal flaw from a uh, kind of uh, 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 Greek theater uh, perspective that we made very early on in the, in the environmental community that we've treated NBS as separate. What we need to do is we actually need to get into other agendas. We're the weak ones and we need to learn their language and approaches. Uh, for instance, this is a publication that we did with uh, TNC and the Global Resilience Partnership that looked at source water resilience and climate adaptation, uh, a really critical issue uh, with a, a lot of global examples there. And this is a global commission adaptation paper that came out uh, a little over a year ago uh, adaptation's thirst. Uh, it also is trying to embed NBS in their particular niche uh, and strengths and weaknesses uh, within the larger uh, climate adaptation discussion. Uh, ultimately, I think we have to make trade-offs more clear and more transparent. Uh, and here, this is as, a, as an ecologist, I become a kind of a strange ecologist. Uh, probably a lot of people would say I was strange to begin with, but uh, I uh, I think uh, actually uh, as an ecologist, the, one of the most powerful tools that we have is actually to take ecological insights and knowledge, not dumb it down, but actually embed it inside uh, of, of other tools and finance may be the most important one. Um, we worked with a consortium, we crowdsourced with several hundred people uh, in a series of phases over uh, a six year period, it's actually still ongoing. Uh, to develop uh, water resilience criteria for different types of investment projects for the bonds market, especially green and climate bonds. On the left, you see here, uh, uh, one of them was a very famous bond, uh, city of Cape Town. It's around uh, 80 million uh, US. Uh, 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 it included uh, both uh, 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 nature-based solutions and gray solutions. But it had, uh, you know, the strength of this approach is it, it's very clear. It communicates to issuers what the uh, expectations are and investors, the transparency about what the trade-offs were 
and what was done, how much people really suffered for their art in putting together uh, the, this, this work. Um, and we use, uh, uh, I think, a very complex and sophisticated uh, approach to thinking about what water resilience means, uh, especially for NBS uh, uh, that uh, uh, was then uh, applied uh, in, a, in a kind of a checklist, embedded checklist uh, and decision tree approach. Over 12 billion US since 2017 um, across six continents uh, have been certified using this. And I actually think the footprint is much larger, probably closer to 20 billion at this stage for a wide variety of investment types. And uh, most importantly, it avoids many of the really negative traps of climate finance that are especially difficult uh, when we talk about water. Uh, and then uh, this is a, 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 an example of granularity. Uh, uh, we, uh, starting about two years ago, we embedded very deeply with the Asian Development Bank uh, talking to many of the regional uh, and thematic sectoral programs to develop a, a kind of a looking at how they make many of their sectoral decisions and thinking where in BS and climate uh, are actually really critical to consider. It's two things that we're doing at the same time, which is uh, quite complicated. In this case, we were looking at, at water, cities and transport. Uh, uh, water is an easy one uh, to align with climate. Um, uh, but uh, cities and transport, not always the most obvious and certainly not always the most obvious from a, uh, an MBS perspective. Uh, this is this launched, I think last December uh, and is about to be reissued in kind of a more glossy and colorful version. But we're really looking uh, about how to scale this, this up more generally. And we're doing something very similar with the water sector uh, at the ADB uh, on a larger scale now. And I just went in with a quote uh, what if we could design a seawall that could heal itself? We can, it's called a sand dune. This is a, a quote from a friend of mine uh, a couple of years ago. I think it captures that sometimes, you know, what we need to do is communicate about these issues in a different way, in a more fundamental way help, to help us revision uh, 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 NBS from the way that maybe we think about it into the way that the, the people that we're trying to engage with, that they think about these topics. Thank you very much. I look forward to the panel. Thank you, John, very much. So we're just a few minutes over time, but we're going to take a five minute break to allow our translator to rest her voice. Um, this is one of the most active Q&A sessions I've ever seen. It's fantastic. Uh, so I will do my best uh, during these five minutes to sort of catch up and uh, summarize where we'll try to focus in the last uh, 20 minutes of the, uh, of the um, program. So we'll see you again here at uh, 110. Thank you.
For those of you who can hear me, we'll start in about a minute. Okay, we're back. I'm gonna invite all the panelists to turn on their cameras. And I hope um, everyone is with us and maybe had a chance to scan this incredible number of questions and thanks to the panelists who've been far more productive than I have in responding. I'm going to, we don't have that much time. We, I think we have, sort of two buckets and we have 10 minutes each for the, each of the panelists to talk a little bit. And I'm, I'm thinking that um, one bucket, we heard a lot about scale and we heard a lot about the need for local engagement, the fact that there's local research that uh, Adrian, I'd invite you to explain a little bit why the Nepal project seemed to have higher rates of return for small scale, but as they got bigger, because we all went scale, but your data seemed to point in the opposite direction. So I'd like to hear a little bit about how we think systemically uh, going broad, getting governments and donors to embrace MBS, to go to the climate cop, to get governments to put climate uh, uh, water resilience into their NDCs. How do, how do we balance thinking big and top down versus, well, actually all the knowledge is local, all the economics is local, all the science is local. So how do we balance this top down? Now this gets to me, another way to phrase this is theory of change. What, what really makes a difference? And if, you know, if we can talk about a little bit on that. Now, my second bucket will be more on methodology. There's a lot of questions about economics, finance, uh, science, et cetera. So we'll get to that later, but let's talk about first the dynamics of change. How do we get there? What are the next steps for this, this brilliant group of practitioners? Um, why don't we go in the same order, Kate, Adrian, and John, and uh, let's tackle the big questions. Kate. I'm, I'm gonna punt because I couldn't hear the first part of your question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt to Adrian and we can come back around to me. I'm sure I'll have something to say by then. Okay, it's about uh, big picture, top down. Looking, uh, uh, even one more comment. John quoted Zach Goldsmith, the British minister saying, don't isolate MBS, make sure we have the big view. I talked about the Global Commission on Adaptation. Let's have the big view. I'm not convinced it works, frankly. It's important conceptually, but I'm not sure it drives change. What drives change are people who care about water. Anyway, Adrian, over to you. Um, great, yeah, thank you for that question. And thanks to everyone who's put their questions in the, in the Q and A box. So um, yeah, I think that there, there's obviously different um, angles that we need to tackle this. And I think that, that having MBS not perceived as a separate thing. It's not an environmental issue or a water security issue. It is a fundamental pillar of development and there, therefore needs to be included in all development decisions as a fundamental pillar. How do we use nature as one of the tools in our toolbox? Um, and so I can't speak to all of the issues of scaling up. I'm gonna leave some of that to John and Kate, but just from the science side and to respond to some of the questions in the chat about, um, about, you know, how is it that we have, you know, we have to think about local context and a lot of our science is done locally and a lot of our knowledge is local. But I do think that we have some tools for understanding how those local impacts can scale up. And so, yes, monitoring and measurement of impacts needs to be done locally, but it also needs to be done in a, in a nested approach. You need to have, um, you need to design monitoring schemes that measure local impacts, but also watershed scale impacts and basin scale impacts. And if you're only looking at one of those scales, you're never going to get the full picture. And so it's really important, I think, to integrate 
the science at at those different scales. If you have really good local measurements and you have really good models, you can use the models to say what happens if we scale up. And that's what we've done in some of our um, projects that I mentioned in my talk. And that is, um, but it, it it is dependent on the the quality of the data that we have to feed the models that comes from that more local scale. And then it is dependent on data available at larger scales to validate those models and to enable us to look at counterfactuals. Um, and then I, that's just from the science side and I not to say that that's all that is needed, but I am going to hand it over to others to speak to some of the other elements. Thanks. John, I, I did uh, reference you that uh, the challenge is, do we really want to promote this with water utility companies and communities who need water who get flooded? Or do we really emphasize the full benefits of nature? I mean, we love both, but uh, over to you. I, I, I mean, I, I, I work uh, quite globally. Uh, my, my general experience, it doesn't matter. I, I happen to be based in Oregon. It doesn't matter if I'm in the US or I am in a middle income country or an LDC. Uh, I, I think that you always need to talk with people about what they want to talk about. And, uh, uh, I, and, I, and, and what they value, how, how they define success and failure. Uh, and almost invariably, uh, NBS will be a part of those set of solutions. Uh, I, I think it, the framing of this session, I think, is very careful. We, we are talking about two things. We're talking about uh, a climate resilience and we're talking about NBS. Those are, 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 they overlap to some degree, but they are not uh, a perfect fit. And, and I actually think that the, the, the greater room for opening up the conversation is on the climate side, um, because the, the adaptation uh, and resilience are essentially a revolutionary paradigm. They tell us that many of the things that we've been doing, that we've been measuring uh, are uh, not just not functioning, uh, they actually are, are wrong. Uh, a very quick example there is that we uh, focus very much in water on efficiency as a kind of a scorecard of virtue. Um, uh, uh, efficiency is almost the opposite of resilience. It, it, is a, uh, it, it, is, it, it is probably a better measure in many cases actually of risk and vulnerability. Uh, uh, and uh, when we try to think, when we try to, uh, I think as Adrian showed very well, uh, we try to redefine the, the, the problem to make sure, and uh, Kate as well, make, make sure that the, that the scale of the problem uh, as we've defined it actually matches the problem as it exists on the landscape, that, that suddenly uh, nature-based solutions make a huge uh, amount of, part of our portfolio of solutions uh, in how we try to meet those stakeholder needs and, and concerns. Thanks. And I'm, I'm, I'm back you. on tap now. Um, <laughs> you know, to, to answer a big question, I'm going to propose two sort of big ideas. And one of them, I think, is that we do really have to think about systems management. Um, so that means integrating nature-based solutions into all of these other things we want to do. But it's also thinking about everything from, you know, development to road building in a more integrated way. And to me, that's really about getting to the heart of what are we actually trying to achieve. Um, and so usually we're not trying to achieve water in a well, we're trying to achieve the things that we're using that water for. And so thinking holistically about all the ways that nature and built systems can support that end product gives us a lot more options and those options are more resilient and there's just a lot more ways to attack the problem and nature's part of that. And that also, I think, really opens up some doors for us. Um, I sometimes hear complaints from investors that we don't have the kind of um, easy engineering tables for green infrastructure for water that we have for gray infrastructure. And that's because we haven't spent nearly as much money and time investigating green infrastructure as we have measuring the effectiveness of culverts of different sizes. Um, 
But it also turns out that we may not need that information, or at least we may not need that information right away in order to be clear on these, some of these interventions making a lot of sense. And so part of understanding what our what our end goal is, is what do we need to know to get there? And if we know that the magnitude and direction is right, is that sufficient? And many times it is. And that's something that's important to remember with this. Connected to that is kind of another big idea, which is that there is no point when people haven't lived in and with nature. And connected to that, there's no point when humans haven't managed nature in certain ways. So if we think about a continuum of um, total wilderness to city with nothing green in it, there's, there's a lot in between there. It's not an either or. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, we're really talking about let's work with nature. Let's enhance the things that are working for us and let's try to avoid or move around the things that are not working for us because there's lots of things that don't work for us like it really is kind of sad to not have something over your head when it rains um, let's work with nature to make that happen better um, and thinking about that continuum and where on that continuum we can we can intervene and manage to get the best solution is a big part of this i think Okay, I mean, I do think part of the complexity of this issue is simply it's complexity. Kate, even in your one of your final slides, you talked about you know nature isn't just we're not just restoring it, we're also using it to avoid problems, we're using it to solve problems, we're using it to to to, uh, to enjoy. Anyway, we get the complexity now. Let now let's turn to the methodology. Uh, Chris, uh, I forget Chris's last name, short and sweet, said we're on the wrong track. These are all economics issues. Now I'm an economist. I like economics. I think I have a balanced view of how far economics gets us. I wish it got us further sometimes, just like I'm sure scientists, particularly in the Trump era, felt that we wish science got us further than it does. So I don't have illusions about how far economics can get us, but we've had a lot of questions in the chat about methodology. How do we value water? Do we, how do we value, the steady services like waters, a lot of interest in water quality, is that undervalued and how do we do that better? What about the, the probabilistic events? How do we value flood control when it may or may not happen? It may be severe, it may be light, it may be something people in Houston remember, it may be something that people in uh, Miami haven't had for a while, you know, who knows? Um, what are some tips? And then I think to, to frame this question, somebody asked, what are some good research agenda items to go forward? Is economics the cutting edge or is that too simplistic that we need more understanding on every front? Why don't we tackle methodology? If there's any questions that were put to you, uh, take this also a moment to, uh, to answer some of those. Uh, maybe the same order. Um, Adrian first. Sure. Um, yeah, and I do think that there are there are no easy answers in terms of methodology. Um, I think that the, I do think that that measuring probabilistic events um, requires a bit more careful thinking and analysis. Um, and but in reality, all all events are probabilistic. Um, just to give a brief example, the way that we the way that we address the risk of landslides in the Nepal study I showed earlier was looking at, you know, we, we don't, we can't predict exactly when and where a landslide is going to occur, but what we can do is look at the, you know, based on the physical characteristics and the vegetation cover, what is the probability that a landslide might occur in a given region? And what is the probability that it is going to affect a, a road or a home or some people nearby? Um, and then being able to, uh, model you know if the vegetation is is improved and the slope is stabilized how does that change the probability of the slide and then the probability that it's going to have an impact and so there are ways to do these kind of probabilistic analyses um, and and then express those those benefits but i do think it's also important at this point to note when we're talking about major floods and we're talking about landslides um, and things like this that there is a a a physical limit to what vegetation can do. And it has is, is been shown um, 
very clearly that you know more trees, more vegetation is is useful up to a point when it comes to risks of flood and landslides, but above a certain point, we are subject to these large geologic processes like extreme floods and very large landslides and earthquake induced landslides that vegetation is just an MBS is not going to help. But I think that it is important then to note one of the biggest benefits that I think is often not um, appreciated from MBS is the is is planning like kate said with key, just taking advantage of the nature that we already have so for example the room for the river the benefit in the room for the river is not that you have more vegetation in the river and it's going to reduce flooding the benefit is that you've moved people out of the floodplain as so you take people at risk and move them away from that that area of risk and you're therefore you're using the vegetation you're using the natural floodplain as a way to um as a way to mitigate that risk but the benefit doesn't come from planting trees there. Any quick thoughts and then we'll move on on research priorities. Um, research priorities. Um, I, well, I think I, I put some things in the Q and A about just the need for, for monitoring at multiple scales, but I do think that there is just to add on to that beyond the water perspective, I think there's a huge amount, a huge need for how these practices and these programs Im impact people in terms of health, in terms of mental well-being, in terms of poverty alleviation, and how these programs and practices are either perpetuating existing structural inequalities or they are helping to alleviate those. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Okay, great. So Adrian, you're talking about a lot of benefits that aren't necessarily easily valued in terms of economics. John, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have, have a, a small disagreement with, uh, with Adrian. I'm not sure that everything's probabilistic. Uh, we can often come up with probabilities, but I, uh, uh, I have little faith uh, in many of those uh, probabilities. I, I think it's very easy to say that the largest risks that we face from climate change are floods and droughts. Uh, actually, we do a great job of preparing for floods and droughts but only when we can come up with a good estimate of what they're going to look like. And, and I, I'd actually argue that the larger issue is that we don't know what they're going to look like in the future uh, on top of a whole range of other attributes. And many of the kind of facile tools that we have, you know, these quite sophisticated, delicate uh, uh, climate models. Uh, I mean, I, th I think the scientific phrase is that they suck uh, on water. Um, the, uh, that, that's, that, that, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I had to get a PhD to say that. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they are awful and, and they're admittedly awful uh, from the climate scientist and they're not going to improve. This is part of the kind of, uh, can't do, are we waiting on something that's going to appear? There's a study that just came out last week on just exactly how bad uh, even the latest generations of GCMs are on water. Um, so that what that means is that uh, uh, we, we actually need to place uncertainty at the center of our work. Uh, uh, that, that means that uh, I, I was uh, picking on efficiency earlier. Uh, efficiency is about envisioning a single future. Uh, it's, a, it's about optimizing systems. Uh, and uh, our design and planning processes, certainly our economic analyses, that they are built on, on an assumption of of uh, that, that we can optimize, that we can move towards a single future. I think we, for the threats that we're pretty sure are going to happen, we can be robust to them, but there's a huge amount of residual uncertainty, especially if we try to think about uh, 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 resilience and sustainability over time scales that actually matter for NBS and for the, the, the lifetime of the infrastructure that we're building in, in utilities or for energy. Uh, uh, for agriculture. That's something in many decades, sometimes in many centuries. Uh, and once we shift that, that framework, it actually shows that I think we kind of have to update a different type of software. We have to update the software that we use that allows to choose between uh, alternatives. Uh, and and, and uh, right now in the best institutions, and I would say you know, the World Bank, the ADB are good examples there, we're kind of hot wiring an existing system that is, is kind of designed to fail from a resilience perspective. 
uh, what we actually really need to do is work really closely as a research priority about uh, at both a micro and a macroeconomic level about how to think about a non-optimized uh, uh, approach uh, to valuation. Okay. Good. I'm going to have to cut you off. We're running out of time. <clears throat> An old friend of mine, Mark Murphy, said we do a great job protecting humans and infrastructure from floods and droughts. Not so good at protecting natural systems. I know he lives in Arizona. He's probably thinking of the Grand Canyon. By regulating water, we really messed up the Grand Canyon for a long time. Okay, Kate, last word. Only one minute. I'm sorry. Um, I want to really just build on what Adrian and John have said, and you know, thinking about the economics to come back to sort of the core of your original question. A couple of thoughts of that. Um, you know, whether it's probabilistic or not, we we frequently don't actually know the biophysical side, whether it's the climate models that John was talking about, or that great graph that Adrian showed where it's like, well, if you change the land cover, your water might go up or it might go down. Um, so if we picked a biophysical point anywhere in there, we could put a price on it. But if we don't know what the biophysics are doing, that's going to make the price pretty um, not, not very useful. So I certainly don't think that the economics is the be all and end all, but I do think it does two things that are super useful for us. One of them is allow us to compare not just apples and oranges, but like apples and donkeys. Um, and the other thing is that it really forces us to talk about the specific things that we value. Um, so, I hang out with biogeochemists and they talk a lot about nitrogen cycling as an ecosystem service. And I actually believe that they do value nitrogen cycling, but most of the world does not value nitrogen cycling. They value what their water quality looks like at the end of the day and whether it's going to make them sick. Um, and so, you know, talking about economic valuation makes us articulate, well, what, what is it that we care about? And, this comes back to this kind of systems thinking, what's the end, what are the multiple pathways for getting there? Um, I will also note, somebody asked, why don't we just put a price on water? Um, there's actually some, some evidence that higher prices of water cause people to use less. There's other evidence that higher prices of water allow those who feel that they have thus rightfully purchased water to use as much of it as they want. Um, this is obviously a problem and does not solve our problem. And we do lots of things that we don't sort of make economically rational. Um, health, I think, is a big one. We don't put health limits on toxics based on how much it's going to cost to control those toxics. We put those health limits on there because of how it's going to affect people and sometimes animals. And so, you know, this, I think, fits into that same complex network of Sometimes you want a price and sometimes the price is not what's important at all. And so thinking about the value, um, what do we care about? What, are, what is our end goal? What are we trying to get is uh, where this really, where the rubber hits the road or the grass hits the road and we can, you know, make nature-based solutions work. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut this off. I think um, uh, one of Kate's last points was sort of communicating this and you know, are people at the center? Well, I think for communication purposes through governments, through communities, through, you know, even international finance, for example, a lot of it, people should be at the center. And uh, there's a program, maybe you're familiar with it called Cities for Forests, which actually I think has a pretty good communication uh, approach to convince urban dwellers that forests and by implication water as well matter. They talk about the nearby benefits green spaces, lower temperature, you know, cleaner air. They talk about the medium benefits, watersheds, uh, recreational value, uh, aesthetic value. Uh, and then they talk about the longer values, which are longer distance, which are the, 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 the biodiversity and the, the carbon sequestration. So we need all three dimensions. And this is one way. I like uh, Adrian's reference to the nested approach. Um, no simple answer. It's all nested. It's all related. Uh, thanks to the panelists, thanks to Adrian for organizing, Gretchen for introducing, thanks to uh, John and Kate uh, for uh, presentations and discussion, and to uh, Senora Pardo for the translating. Thanks, everyone, and have a good day.
Thank you. Before you um, go, everyone, just wanted to mention briefly that we are going to have a recording of this webinar available on our YouTube channel, which we'll send out a link after the event. Um, and we hope that you do join us for uh, the next in our series of conversations on co climate smart coastal planning and sustainable development in Latin America and the Caribbean and land use planning in the Amazon. So thanks, Carter, um, for the great moderation and uh, everyone have a have a wonderful day.